Hello and welcome back to another episode of Critical Reactions with your host Brian. We're going to continue on with this week's theme of retro video game soundtracks exploring a very popular song from Final Fantasy VII called One Winged Angel, composed by Nobuo Uematsu. Let's uh, dive into this. I've heard this song, I'm sure, but I haven't played Final Fantasy VII since I was like... 15 or something so uh it might ring a bell it might be something i don't remember at all who knows let's dive in and see what's going on with one winged angel interesting use of dissonance there to create tension <laughs> the offbeat accents on the brass coming in. The constant quarter note accent gives it a very, uh, a, a, a feeling of strength. Yeah. Cool little hocket there. Blurry. It's interesting how much it shares with the Imperial March. Not even just like rhythmically, but also harmonically. There's this bouncing between a low note and a high note that's pretty consistent in many of these sections. The offbeat staccatos. <laughs> what? Very industrial with almost that symbol almost sounds like steam being released. Fun little waltz. Waltz is already gone. Okay. There's a consistent theme that I've heard so far of build the foundation and then layer on top of that. A lot of these sections are sort of like slow burns. That really quiet snare roll at the end of the last section though, I barely caught that gave just enough underlying energy to feel like it built into this, which is a return back to an older section.
All right. Yeah. What's wild is I know that we've begun repeating ideas, but I don't know when that happens. I don't really remember returning to the first section, so I don't know where the loop began. <laughs> I picked up the transition on that time. That MIDI uh, single stick roll on the snare. <laughs> Yeah, there's a lot to talk about. I think it's going to be a pretty lengthy video. I got a lot of topics going around in my head. Alright. And then that's our fade out because we've begun repeating things again. And see, that's sort of how I think most of the music's going to be this week, is that it's going to be a shorter looped idea. Most of the videos or tracks that we listen to will probably play it twice, but they will be things that infinitely loop. It won't be like yesterday, where we had a song that probably took place during credits. Um, I haven't had a chance to read the comments on that one to see uh, if anyone told me where it's placed, but... It definitely feels some, like something that's a bit more constructed and less out of the player's control um, so that it could be directed in a more linear pattern. Alright. So. There's a lot of cool things going on in here. First of all, I want to talk about some patterns in composition style that I've I noticed throughout here. Uh, and then I think I want to talk about uh, transitions and then atmosphere, emotion, what I kind of get out of it, the story the music told me. And I think that's going to wrap it up. I was going to say and then lyrics, but uh, unless I can find the Latin that I assume that they're singing in uh, for the choir, it doesn't really have words. So <laughs> we don't really have to worry about that today. Uh, so yeah, let's kick it off with some patterns that uh, I picked up on one is the slow burn. This is pretty cool. It, it happens so often in this track where we begin with a foundational idea. Maybe it's just uh, a percussion thing. There's a few sections that start off with heavy timpani uh, focus. Um, sometimes it's just low rend in general. The timpani's there, but also like a bass guitar. Uh, just a general idea though. Sometimes when we go to something that would be a bit uh, lighter, we bring the volume down and we just have flutes maybe presenting a da, 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 a very short rhythmic idea, not really melodic, not really harmonic, just giving us, again, a foundation, a bass line. From there, every four bars or so, we add a few more layers, a few more layers. It isn't like a, uh, a, a typical slow burn in, say, post-rock, in which every cycle, whether that's four or eight bars, will add another instrument. But I think that's primarily because in post-rock you have four to five instruments maybe. So you can't really add them in groups or you're going to get through your slow burn, your build-up rather quickly. Whereas in here, we have seemingly pretty close to a full orchestra. So if you add one instrument at a time, you'll be here forever. So we add groups of instruments and we'll get the, the first layer on top of the foundation. And it'll be 
you know, the flutes and maybe trumpets, and then we'll put another layer on in the next four bars, and that might be the strings and, you know, snare roll or something like that. And so we get them in groups of ideas. And it's what, what I like about this is that it makes it, it adds layers and density. Whereas in post-rock, I'm going to keep relating it back to this, you get one instrument provided and it's really quick to figure out what that instrument's doing and then be left waiting for the next instrument to come in. But here, it feels like there's so much added in each four bar section that I don't have time to hear all of it before the next stack of instruments is coming in. So from a, a perspective of how I listen to music in this context, my active listening, I don't ever find myself getting bored through these miniature slow burns in the same way that I do in rock style slow burns. And I do think a lot of that is, I mean, part of it's due to the speed. Like I said, we're working with four bar phrases, tops, and usually these slow burns are no longer than 40 seconds or, or so. Uh, and that's why I call them quasi slow burns. They are crafted in the same manner. You start with the foundation and then you add layers on every repetition, but they go by so quickly. It's not really a slow burn. It's just a progression by layers, I guess we could call it. Uh, building a song up section by section by adding new things to it. Um, but yeah, there's just like so many things added every single cycle through. Uh, and one, I think that's awesome because it isn't, it isn't this linear slow progression through it. It really honestly feels like the section gets completely recontextualized with each group of ideas coming in. Cause it's not just groups of instruments either. They're all playing different things. We sometimes have three to four brand new ideas for each cycle. And so, it, I don't know. It's like. Let's go visual, right? We start with red and then we add like three more colors and then three more colors. And now we have a rainbow after just two additions to our foundation. The rainbow is very distinct from a single stripe of red. And that's what I feel like here. Each group massively changes how the section feels more so than the slow evolution that we would hear in a more traditional uh, slow burn. And I really like this. You can hear it throughout this entire track. Every section is introduced with a baseline idea and then built on from that. It is, it's an interesting way to go about it. I'm curious if we hear a lot of that on this soundtrack or maybe in Nobuo Uematsu's work in general. I haven't really studied much of it. I know he's a really big composer in the video game world. Um, and I think he's written most or all of the Final Fantasy work, which, I mean, yeah, those are highly regarded in the video game world. Um, but I honestly have never really given a, a lot of deep thought to it. And it makes me want to dig more into it, see if it was something that he utilized specifically for this track or maybe for this album to represent specific themes throughout the story or the characterization of the one winged angel. Um, or if this is just something that he uses in his works in general. Because the interesting thing is, while the music is very classical, this feels very modern. Um, and I like it. It's a nice merger. And it's probably why so many people have an affinity towards uh, this soundtrack or even this song. I know this is a very popular song even just from within uh, this game, but uh, it, it presents something that feels very classical in tone, in harmony, in sonic landscape, but the composition feels very modern and it feels like something that uh, would be appealing to a modern audience. And so it could very well be a gateway or a bridge song album composer into the realm of classical. And I kind of hope that it might be for some people. They get into this and they're like, oh, this actually sounds cool. And they start listening to more or orchestral work. I don't know if that actually happens, but I suppose it could. Um, here's another cool thing that he does in his works. Well, in this track anyways. The idea of 
never doing the same thing twice, and also Badon passing. I don't really know how to navigate these two linguistically. I don't really have cool phrases for them. It's not really musical terms for what's going on, at least not that I know of. Uh, so we're going to kind of smash these two together and try to explore them simultaneously. The first is that he does like to use this column response concept where he will have one instrument play one idea and then another instrument will play another idea. It's like, oh, cool, baton pass. The focus is being shifted between different instruments. But then it'll go back to the first one. They'll repeat what they played, but it'll go to a totally different instrument doing a totally different line. It's a different call and response. This happens all over the place. It is very cool to see this utilized often. But here's the strange thing too, is that it's very rarely done more than just the, the two times. The call, the first response, the call, the second response. And occasionally, there's a little variation on the idea where the second call is a variation of the first. It's close to what the instruments did on the first call, but slightly different, maybe a little bit of an ornament ornamentation put in there, maybe it's risen up a third or a fifth in pitch uh, to create some escalation and intensity, something like that. But it's, it's, it's present all over the place. And it's very cool because it feels like it's beginning to build the idea of motif and then just never fully commits to it. Ooh, which actually ties into something else. It was going to be a negative, and I know I can catch a lot of flack on this for having criticism of this track, but uh, <laughs> I think I'm going to go for it anyways. But actually, I might have a way to twist this into something more positive from an artistic perspective. But yeah, so we're, I'm just going to, whew, I'm just going to foreshadow that. Y'all can wait or check the timestamps, I guess, <laughs> for, for that uh, topic. But yeah, like I said, it, it begins the idea of motif every single time, at least the first time through while, while everything was still really fresh to me. I was like, okay, we got a, we got this baton pass going on. Oh, actually, it's call and response. Oh, but here's a new response. But then we never get back to that original call again for a third or fourth uh, way through it. It's always cut short. And so the idea that this could be some sort of home base idea, the, the call to the song always... It gets removed. It never gets fulfilled. The idea of having an ostinato or a repeated phrase is chucked out the window. We heard it twice and we move on from it to something different entirely. Frequently, this is also used at the end of sections before transitioning into a new idea, which makes it feel even more uh, cut short. An idea that could have been expanded into something larger, but ultimately never quite reached that final form was uh you know had its had its uh, potential diminished in some way and it happens so frequently that it almost reaches a verge of being frustrating if the song just weren't as interesting and moving as quickly paced as it was that by the time i'm like ah dang again we've already moved on to something else that's really cool usually an interesting foundation where we start to build things and i'm past it i've forgotten about the fact already <laughs> that we didn't get to do anything uh with that in, in any larger capacity it was uh sort of a, a blink and you'll miss it missed opportunity and uh you know when <sighs> i said i'd do it later let's just do it right now this song is kind of lacking cohesion. It's a mishmash of a lot of stuff. Many of the sections have transitions that do kind of smoothly move between the ideas in a way that I don't think that this is a, uh, a jumbled mess of random ideas. There are connective concepts between them usually these connective concepts are a bit more surface level hey we had a flute and the last track or and the last section the flute was also our primary instrument in the transition and the flute is kicking off our new section and so there is this little bridge between the two but if you were to remove that bridge and then just smash the two sections back to back, there's very little that gets carried over from one to the next. In fact, many of these sections also change harmonic ideas. We go into completely new atmospheres and emotions, chord progression, stuff like that. Melodies are very rarely used or reutilized. We don't have a sense of theme, leitmotif, or ostinato in here, really. 
The closest thing to a theme I could think of would be the rhythmic cadence, the constant quarter note attacks, just that that very militaristic uh, feeling of strength, the heavy accent on every downbeat. That's really the biggest element of, of glue holding this entire song together and not feeling so disparate. Um, in fact, there's even one transition towards the end, and now that I think about it, it might be the loop back, uh, the last section back to the first section again. Uh, it's just very... Uh, it, it's 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 harsh juxtaposition there isn't a transition between them we just go from a heavier uh last section into a lighter first section and it is a is a bit of a jarring loop it feels like it should be a transition but it isn't it's just the next section starting again um and so every time we start to build things up as i said we get foundation layer 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 sometimes layer and then we start over again, back at another foundation. This one a bit different than the last section. Layer, 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 foundation, layer. And that's how the song is built once again. <laughs> this is, this is you know, I'm tying it back here. It's about building potential and not delivering on, uh, you know, the, the ultimate form of it. Every time we reach a point where I'm like, this is cool, I'd like to see where we go from here, we start over from scratch again doing something totally different. Everything feels a bit, in a sense, incomplete. I don't necessarily want to say that any of these sections feel like they're lacking anything, but they don't really tie into anything else. We reach a point of satisfaction, this section sounds fine where it's at, and then we just start over and do it again with something else. We never really get to see anything through to any sort of fruition. Everything is cut short to explore something else. And we see that on the microcosm with the call and response and call and second response, and then we just drop the idea entirely. But we also see it from section to section. There really isn't anything that ties things together. One section of the track has a little bit of a... Uh, uh, oh... It has a harmonic element that reminds me of the Imperial March, Darth Vader's theme song, in a sense. I don't think it was originally supposed to be Darth Vader's theme song, but it's what a lot of people attribute to him. Um, and I even pointed it out in there. There's another section that uh, felt a bit... What was it? There's a chord progression in there. And I was like, hmm. It reminded me of something else. I couldn't think of what it was, but it was like totally different from anything that came before it. And like this continued to happen. The chord progression shifts from every section to every section. Um, and I find it wild that as much as this feels like a series of individual ideas, it still comes together some way. And like I said, I think part of that might be something harmonic, but there's also the rhythmic element that ties everything together here as well. It's fascinating to find this become something that feels whole on some level, despite obviously being parts of several pieces. It is very much like being able to see the forest and the trees simultaneously. You, you, you're able to immediately notice individual trees and their characteristics, but it doesn't make you miss the concept of the forest. Very cool. Like I said, I was going to have that to be a negative because uh, I was originally a little bit upset that a song as highly heralded as this ends up feeling very uh, incohesive. But I, I do think it ends up being a positive for it. It's a unique characteristic for it. And for all I know, it does a great job at characterizing the event that it's played over or the character who it's a leitmotif for or whatever. I'm... <laughs> Like I said, it's been a long time since I played Final Fantasy VII. I don't know who the one-winged angel could be. <laughs> so, uh, I don't even know where this would have played in the game, much less do I remember the song itself. Um, but yeah, I do wonder if there is an artistic element to it as well. Maybe uh, an event or a person that is fractured but whole. I don't know. Um... theming, emotion. We do have strength here, a stoicness, a power. This comes from the very rigid quarter note accents. 
we can see in the intro that we never really get back to again, do we? I think that's what threw me off, is that the intro to the song is not part of the game, or it's not part of the song loop. The song loop is like sections two through six or something like that, and section one, the intro, is never revisited. Uh, but it immediately introduces tension, uh, a lack of harmony, a strong essence of dissonance, uh, creating more tension. We have the strength, this rigidity of uh, rhythm. It speaks to me as somebody who is very steadfast in uh, their morals, possibly. They're hard-headed. Uh, they're powerful. And they are a danger or a threat to someone or something. There's a lot of sections in this track that tend to utilize heavy elements of stress or tension, usually through harmonic devices like dissonance or rhythmic devices, uh, such as, interestingly, the offbeat accents that we get occasionally. Uh, they're usually paired with very dissonant tones in order to further lean into the oddity of that. The whole song has this really rigid downbeat accent and then every once in a while we get these offbeats that are heavily dissonant and it's like oh that was odd and it was very tense and so it compounds and makes it feel even more dangerous. Um, but what's cool is that there's also an introspectiveness to it. Some of the lighter sections especially the fruit the flute lead <laughs> sections <laughs> Yeah, they play bananas in here, the fruit let sections. Uh, no, when we kind of bring the intensity down and we have the flutes, uh, these tend to be a bit more softer, more introspective, harmonically, and even sonically. As I said, we bring the intensity and volume down in these. Um, and it almost seems to be somebody who is steadfast um, in their ideals, but possibly wanting something more. Maybe they are not convinced that the ends will justify the means, but they feel they don't have any other choice. Something along those lines. I do know that the game was about, like, uh, uh, the world being destroyed by technology, and we had uh, eco-terrorists, which was, like, the main characters trying to destroy all the corporations in order to help free the planet or something like that. The more I think about it, it's very appropriate for today. <laughs> I might should uh, check this out again. Uh, play it again. Yeah, like I said, it's been decades. I don't remember much about it anyways. Um, but maybe that's who it's supposed to be in, per in the one-winged angel. Would be like a fallen angel. Somebody who is, uh, well, kind of going along with those same ideals. Someone who is trying to do their best to for good to, to have a positive effect on the world but they lack the fully angelic stature and that might be because their actions are not necessarily great they know that the uh, the ends are going to be worth it but they're not necessarily sure about their means so they're an angel but only half of an angel maybe and it, like I said, I don't know. It's been a long time since I played this game, so I don't know who it might be personifying, or even if it's just an event as well. But uh, yeah, so strength, stoicness, um, dedication, but also a little bit of introspection, which could be uh, some doubt, uh, and danger. Uh, something to be feared. That's sort of what I get out of all of this. Um... Oh, actually, there is one more thing I want to bring up real quick, and it has to do with lyrics, in a sense. So I think I will pause and see if I can find the lyrics for this, if there are any documented about what the choir was singing, if they were actually singing any language, real language. Um, but a lot of the music is MIDI, and I actually called out some of it. There's a, a MIDI snare roll that I think just sounded phenomenal. It was so obviously not a real snare drum, but it's just a, such a nostalgic sound for me. Um, and, you know, so I'm listening to this. I'm like, okay, this is cool. It's not what I remember. Uh, I know that this song also appeared in uh, the animated film for Final Fantasy VII as well. And I think they used a rock version in there. I know there's a symphonic version that gets played uh, whenever, uh, sorry, an orchestral version that gets played whenever um, they do live performances of the soundtrack. 
And uh, I think I... No. No, I think it's just those two, right? So it's possible, though, that I might have heard this song in a totally different context because I don't really remember the MIDI aspect of this too much. But I do find it really impressive that they could create these sounds as close as they could, which is something I talked about yesterday with the Legend of Zelda song, but that was on a Super NES. This was on a PlayStation 1. This was actually a generation later, um, half a decade, I think, maybe more. I don't know. I'm trying to remember when the PlayStation 1 came out. The Super NES was like mid 90s i think so i might be off on my dates too but anyways what i'm saying is that the technology here was more advanced than what we listened to with yesterday's track so i find it really impressive that the sounds are as accurate or well not not that they're accurate that they're as immediately perceptible as what they're supposed to. I can hear the strings. I can hear the brass. I can hear the percussion. And they didn't really have to use any of the tricks or hacks that we listened to yesterday with the slight delay secondary track doing the same thing the first track is in order to create a type of reverb to make it sound realer. Um, the technology is obviously better here. But what I find really interesting, though, is the, the choir. I do know that this shipped on discs, but I'm kind of confused about how the song came together then. Was it programmed for the sound chip and then saved as an MP3 file to be played off of the disc, which allowed them to also have the choir in there? Or is the choir somehow playing off of the sound chip too? Or did they have a way to play music from the sound chip and like an, an audio file simultaneously in sync. And that just sounds like a nightmare, making sure that they go off at the same time. <laughs> this song would have sounded terrible if there is a hiccup and the choir is coming in on the wrong beat or something like that. Um, so yeah, like I have questions about how they went about doing that. Because, uh, you know, I'm not super knowledgeable about audio chips from the past and limitations and stuff like that but the choir just doesn't sound like something i'd expect the sound chip to do um, especially since it sounds like there's real words here and it isn't just general uh, vowel sounds which is usually how uh, midi choirs work so yeah i'm just uh, i'm i was very shocked to hear the choir in here because like i said i kind of associated them possibly with uh, different performances of it that weren't from this game, the, the original soundtrack, but maybe a, a different performance, an orchestral performance or something like that, a remix of it. So speaking of the choir, let me see if I can find some lyrics to this and then we'll wrap the video up. All right, that was easier than I expected. Uh, it is Latin and... It apparently is about the main villain, Sephiroth. I don't know what battle this would have been. Maybe it's a character theme. It says, burning inside with violent anger, Sephiroth. That's our chorus. It has some loops to it and stuff like that, but that's that's the, the gist of it. We have a pre-chorus that's borrowed from O Fortuna. It says, fate, cruel, and meaningless. And then I think there's only one more... Yeah. Come, come, oh come, don't let me die. Of course, all of this is still lat uh, translated from Latin. The only thing that isn't Latin is the word Sephiroth, which does appear quite a few times in this. But other than that, everything is just a repeat of one of those three ideas. Although there is uh, one time towards the end of the track, during the uh, come and don't let me die section, it has that and then the word uh, glorious and noble. So come, come, oh come, glorious, don't let me die, noble, and this sort of back and forth between the vocals. I don't necessarily remember that part, but uh, that's pretty cool. Um, the annotation states that this is the boss battle music for the final form of Sephiroth. So is this the final boss of the game then? Definitely bombastic, a good end of the, the game song. But I do find it interesting. There is that little bit of introspection. But this is actually something I've talked about before. Um, not on this channel, I don't think. It was in a Discord server. We were talking about video game music. I think somebody was making some video game music. 
And I had mentioned that the battle music for Final Fantasy VII is really cool because it isn't running at 11 the whole time. There is a section in the loop which kind of brings the intensity down to like a 7, kind of has a bit more flurry to it, there's some spaciousness, and then it comes back in and punches with the main uh, energetic battle theme. And the loop is this ebb and flow of high intensity, still intense, but calmer, and it gives some space for the song not to become overbearing or overwhelming in any way, and that is present here as well. The song is very intense through a lot of it, but it does have some dips that bring it down a little bit. This works exceptionally well within the context of having to listen to the song 15, 20, 30 times in a boss battle, depending on how long it takes. But it also puts some characterization into it, I hope. I had mentioned that it felt introspective to me um, and that it was somebody maybe questioning their actions despite having strength in their morals and convictions. Um, I don't know if this represents Sephiroth in any way, but it would be very cool if it did because it is his theme and it's not just the battle theme, something to sound cool while you, uh, you know, participate in this boss battle, but it's also Sephiroth's theme and I think that the portions of it should represent him. And I hope that it does. So, those are my thoughts. Nobuo Uematsu's One Winged Angel from Final Fantasy VII. What did you think of this? Why are my eyes acting up now? <laughs> what did you think of this track? Is there anything in here that stood out to you? Anything you'd like to add on to what I said or correct me on? Uh, just give me your own thoughts, opinions, perspectives about it. Put all that stuff down in the comment section. Above that, in the description box, you'll find a link to Linktree takes you to this menu. You can find links to my music, ways to support the channel, a link to the Discord server, and so much more. Above that, if you could, like, subscribe, and ring the bell. I greatly appreciate all three of those. All right, we do have a special selection coming up next. Otherwise, I'll be back tomorrow, 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 9 p.m. UTC. As usual, we'll continue on with this week's theme, exploring some Donkey Kong Country 2, I think. Until next time, remember to be critical, not cynical, of the music you listen to and have a fantastic morning, afternoon, or evening whenever you choose to watch my videos.